Hi, I'm Leonie from Spines and Splines. To celebrate St. Patrick's Day today, I've decided to make a zine about an aspect of Ireland's past that's fascinated me for a while now. There's a lot of interesting history in Ireland, and after living here for almost five years, I've realised that some of it gets talked about a lot, and some of it doesn't get talked about nearly enough. The things that are remembered are the big devastating moments, and for good reason. The famine, the troubles, Michael Collins, 1916, the laundries, mass emigration. My own ancestors left County Clare near the end of the famine, travelling around 18,000 kilometres to the other side of the world in the hope of building a better life during Australia's gold rush. Nearly 170 years later, I got on a plane to emigrate from Australia to Ireland, landing in Dublin. We lived in the capital for two years before moving again to a rural area just outside Cork City, the second largest town in the Republic. For the uninitiated, the island of Ireland is divided into four provinces, Leinster, Munster, Connaught and Ulster. Zooming in further, we're divided into 32 counties. 26 of those are in the Republic of Ireland and there are six counties in Northern Ireland. The most recent big history is that of the troubles between the Republic and Northern Ireland, with the conflict across the Irish and UK border coming to an end in 1998 with the signing of the Good Friday Agreement. Not all history is big though. It's not all about fighting, devastation and conflict. A lot of the time people don't talk about it, perhaps because it's so subtle or run of the mill that they didn't really notice. Jack Fitzsimons was born on the 26th of April in 1930 in a small rural area of County Meath. I learned about him a few years ago when we were looking to buy a house in a small cork town near where we were renting. The house that we were looking to buy was what is referred to in Ireland as a bungalow, a single storey house built on about a third of an acre of land. When we were talking with our solicitor about the house, she mentioned a little of the history of the bungalow style house and my interest was piqued. I borrowed a couple of books from the local library. One was a copy of the Bungalow Bliss plan books, and the other was a small autobiography called Bungalow Bliss Bias, written by Jack about the events in his life that led him to publishing the Bungalow Bliss books. Jack's father was a farm labourer and his mother was a servant in the local mansion. The family lived in a two-room mud and thatch house that had cracks in the walls. When he was three, Jack's father successfully applied for a council house and also took up a job making the heavy concrete bricks for the other council houses. When he was 10, Jack's six-week-old baby sister died. The official cause of death was pneumonia, but the actual cause of death was poverty. Farm labourers were poor and were considered the lowest of the low in society, if they were thought of at all. Little Annie was buried in a coffin made from a cigarette box. Jack's father explained the death to him as the will of God, which was the ideology of the time. None of the local priests showed up even to offer condolences. When he was older, Jack realised that blaming God for what he deemed a social criminal irresponsibility was a cop-out. Between 1939 and 1945, World War II raged across Europe. Even though Ireland remained neutral during the war, Resources were short and there were very few houses built in rural Ireland. During this time, Jack missed several years of school while working on local farms, but he was eventually able to graduate with his leaving certificate in 1949. After finishing school, he worked for the ESB on the Rural Electrification Scheme, where the goal was to connect every house in Ireland, no matter how remote, to the electricity network. Through this work, he saw firsthand how elated and hopeful people were about the arrival of electricity. The people he visited were really kind and hospitable, so he was invited into tea at almost every house he visited. And because of this, he was able to see up close the kind of housing problems that people had to deal with every day. Most of the houses in the countryside at the time were thatched cottages, 
And because thatched roofs don't have gutters, water drained directly into the yards, leaving them super mucky, which would have been made even muckier by farmyard animals walking backwards and forwards through it. Often there was only one door and any windows were very small, so the cottages were really dark and damp and they needed a lamp or a candle on on even the sunniest days. These kinds of thatched cottages are what many tourists romanticise about Ireland without really thinking about the sustainability and health of the people who actually had to live in them. In 1951, Jack started a new job as a clerk in the Assistant County Engineer's Office in Cowles, and in 1954 he was promoted to the position of draftsman at the Navan County Engineer's Office. One of his first big jobs as a draftsman was to map all the labourers' cottages built in County Meath. One of the issues that's brought up over and over again in articles on bungalows in rural Ireland is that these houses are dispersed randomly and people should instead live in built-up areas and cities. The problem with this is that not everybody works in a city. Back in Jack's day, these people were mainly farm labourers and they needed to live near their place of employment. And while farming is still a major part of rural Irish life, many large companies have set up their factories in these areas. It doesn't make sense to live and commute from a large town or city when you don't work there. The past couple of years have seen a global pandemic where many people in Ireland have been working from home and now, as companies are trying to get people back into the office, there's resistance and people are asking why. As the shift to many people working from home either all or part of the time happens, and it will happen, how we decide where to live will also change. The people who are against countryside living argue that it isn't sustainable because there aren't as many services, but to me that just sounds like an excuse not to spend money on social infrastructure. Back to Jack though. Ever since he had started working, one of his jobs had been to provide drawings and site maps for house extensions, and he would also meet people who wanted plans to build new houses. From his co-workers, he learned how to draw up plans using standard specifications, and his experience working with the council also gave him valuable insight into how people could build houses that satisfied planning permission and qualified for grants. Jack began working at the Office for Public Works and in 1958 took his first exam to qualify as an architect through the Royal Institute of Architects in Ireland. He left the OPW a few years later and started working again as a clerk, getting practical building experience on large housing schemes in Cowles and Navan. He set up a private practice designing and supervising buildings and also came to the realisation that there just weren't a lot of architects either paying attention to or available to help country people with housing issues. People wanted change and improvement, and this is where the Bungalow Bliss books were born. In 1968, Jack married his wife Anne, and they built their own bungalow. People continued to approach Jack to have plans drawn up, and Anne suggested that they try and buy a printing machine to set out his fading and frayed tracings in a book. Anne put a classified in the local paper and immediately a printer in Dublin who had intentions to expand to Cowles gave them a call. The outcome of this was that Jack and Anne negotiated a deal to print 5,000 copies of our 150 page plan book. They sold their bungalow to fund the book and bought a rundown house that needed a lot of fixing up. Anne laid out the book using a manual typewriter and eventually the books were printed and bound and Jack began to travel to bookshops around the country to sell them. The first print run for Bungalow Bliss was 5,000 in July 1971. It topped the bestseller list and sold out in three months. Over the next 30 years, Bungalow Bliss had 12 editions that were all bestsellers in the non-fiction section. Jack's book showed the styles and dimensions of each plan and also contained a wealth of information about how to best situate your build on your land, where to source building materials and how to apply for grants and council planning approval. People could choose a house from the books, then buy the plans from Jack for a small fee. He always advised employing a local architect if the means were available, but the information that he provided allowed people to build on their own if they couldn't afford or find an architect. 
In the years since, a few people with loud voices have derided the Bungalow Bliss books as a downfall of Ireland. They talk about farmers selling off land for a quick payday, or people ruining the west coast of Ireland with second holiday homes built from the plans. They talk about scarring the countryside with modernist ribbon housing in the place of a romanticised image of farming, thatched housing and fields of grass. Weirdly, they don't talk about how those green fields are the result of Ireland having the least amount of forest in Europe, caused over time by the colonisation and clearing of land to provide food for Britain while the Irish starved. When they're busy saying that bungalows are an ugly blight or accusing them all of being poorly built, they rarely also mention the huge housing estate development disasters from the Celtic Tiger years, like the estates built in Donegal and Mayo that are crumbling and unsellable due to being built with substandard building materials containing high levels of mica, or estate houses falling apart in Dublin because they're built on foundations backfilled with pyrite. Ireland is still plagued by housing issues, and it's unlikely that the bungalow style of housing is the answer this time around. 75% of the people I meet have kids who've emigrated to Australia to live and work because they can't afford to stay here. Buying a house here in Ireland is expensive, and renting a house here is even more expensive. A lot of work needs to be done on reimagining, planning and funding housing and communities, and it's going to be complex and difficult. At the same time, there's huge potential to think about the kind of society we want and to come up with exciting and innovative solutions. There are a lot of bungalows where I live in Cork. When I look at them, I see resilience. I see a history of people working hard to make their lives better. I see the fact that a man with the support of his community was able to improve the lives of so many people in such a short amount of time. I see big windows that let in the light. Thanks for watching. If you'd like a copy of the zine I made today, there's a link in the description to my website where you can buy it. And I'll also have links to my shop on Redbubble where you can buy a range of digital prints of my work. You can also support me on Patreon and follow the links to my Facebook page and Instagram. Hit the like button and subscribe to see more of my work and leave a comment if you enjoyed this video. Cheers and happy St. Patrick's Day.